I'm Ben Tron. I just graduated from the program um, last summer. Um, and and obviously residents over at St. Mary's and residency faculty taking care of uh, COVID positive patients in the hospital, um, as well as some community faculty who are kind of on the docket for potential surge plans. So uh, thanks for joining me and hopefully I can give you guys something useful. Um, and, and and this is also my first WebEx, so don't be too hard on me uh, with that and let me know if we're having any issues. Um, so uh, Tom did call me an expert, but uh, I don't know if I, well, he didn't call me an expert. He said my expertise, but I, I don't know if I would consider myself an expert. I have honestly only uh, cross covered a few patients over at TAC. Um, so much of my presentation is really based on my own research, um, expert opinion uh, from you know, meetings with the hospitalist groups, they've been excellent in sharing their experiences as well as um, the experiences of, of hospitalists, uh, ED docs, critical care docs across the countries and in places where it had little higher peaks of, of COVID patients in their hospitals. Um, so that's where a lot of this comes from. And then um, obviously there's, there's limited randomized control trials as far as uh, treatment of COVID patients, but I'll try to review some studies when applicable. Um, I will, uh, before we get into objectives, um, I will probably breeze through some of these things, assuming that most of you ha have knowledge of, of, of some of the things I'm gonna touch on. Um, I will make the slides available um, and Tom will probably send them out. Um, if you feel like I went through something too quickly, you can always just go back and look at them. Or, or, you know, we'll have some time for questions at the end as well. So as far as the goals here today, we'll briefly review current COVID statistics, uh, screening and diagnosis of COVID, um, review management of acute hypoxemic respiratory failure in this setting, as well as the current inpatient treatment recommendations from UW Health, as well as a couple other professional organizations and then we'll talk a little bit about discharge criteria um, uh, or discharge planning for these patients. And, and, and again, hopefully have some time for questions at the end. So this is just taken from um, Wisconsin Department of Health, something that we probably don't need to spend too much time on, 4,346 cases in Wisconsin, 220 deaths, a fairly flat trajectory as far as new cases recently kind of in the mid uh, mid 100s per day of new cases. Um, again, briefly, COVID symptoms, things you guys are probably familiar with, fever, fatigue, dry cough, as well as some of these other things. Um, and then complications uh, of COVID that you may be dealing with. So primarily, obviously, it's gonna be pneumonia. Um, also from a pulmonary standpoint, right? These patients develop ARDS. Cardiac-wise, um, a fair number of patients can develop um, myocarditis, pericarditis, um, new CHF or AFib. Those can be the things that they, they present with. Um, again, a fair amount of them are going to have uh, kidney injury. And then the unique components to this, I would say, are the cytokine storm. It tends to happen later in the illness in these severe patients as well as coagulopathy. And we'll touch on both, both of those things. Um, and, and so the clinical course, you can kind of think these patients, you know, obviously you're going to have your asymptomatic or, or mild patients um, who clear, you know, in a week or whatever. But the patients who are going to decline tend to decline in that five to seven day period with increased shortness of breath. And that's typically when they may present to the hospital. They do seem to stabilize, either stabilize or, or worsen in that kind of following 24 to 48 hour period. So we see this, this very quick decline um, or, or stabilization. And so that's the period of time that you really wanna be keeping your eye on these patients. And then the 10 to 14 day period, or sometimes a little bit later can be the time when you see this cytokine storm um, leading to ARDS and multi-organ failure, which tends to be the cause of death for a lot of these patients. Um, so one unique thing as far as, um, you know, COVID positive patients in the hospital is obviously this aspect of 
trying to reduce transmission, um, protect healthcare workers, et cetera. And, and so that's a primary issue that you're gonna be thinking about the whole time, obviously, when you're taking care of a COVID positive patient. One aspect of that as far as trying to reduce transmission is the physical exam component. Um, the policy currently at the UW is that um, the uh, in-person physical exam only needs to occur uh, if, it, if you feel it will change um, your management of that patient. So if they're having, you know, if you feel like you need to evaluate their volume status, um, you know, do an abdominal or lung exam or other component of the exam that's going to really change your management for that day, then yeah, you need to go in and see them. Otherwise, you can do a video interview and exam um, via, via the VidYO app and um, then document using this dot COVID exam smart phrase um, why you didn't do an in-person exam that day. Um, it is felt, uh, at least for the most part, my understanding is that patients, when they are admitted, do need to be seen by a physician um, at some point during the admission process. Um, that can be the ER doc. Um, and essentially all ER docs are, are doing in-person exams. So as long as they've documented an in-person exam um, and you don't feel like doing an exam yourself is going to change anything, even on your H&P, you can still use the dot COVID exam, um, smart phrase. Um, again, briefly, some things you may already uh, be aware of, lab findings. So these patients tend to uh, uh, present with leukopenia, especially lymphopenia. They, um, a, a concerning feature is um, uh, absolute neutrophil count to lymph, absolute lymphocyte count of greater than 3.5 that ha seems to have a quite high mortality. So. That's something to watch out for if you see that in a patient, you wanna be more concerned about them. Um, the two other things I wanted to point out on this slide were um, this uh, increased inflammatory markers, so D-dimer, CRP, ferritin, as well as kind of the increased IL-6 being a precursor maybe to the cytokine storm issue. Um, so those things I'll talk a little bit more about. And then the low procalcitonin, so you know, that can be helpful in this uh, patient population if you are trying to rule out a secondary bacterial pneumonia. Um, it is felt that these solely COVID positive patients should have a low uh, procalcitonin. And so that's sometimes maybe helpful. Imaging findings here, probably things that you're all aware of, kind of bilateral peripheral opacities. Um, the UW, as far as screening goes, um, UW Hospital is screening some patients. So all patients who are admitted in congregate living facilities, so SNFs, ALFs, et cetera, uh, as well as surgical patients or IMC level patients um, are being screened even if they don't meet the ED or ambulatory and testing criteria. So these are patients that could end up on like a UW family medicine service or other service that doesn't typically take um, COVID positive patients or PUIs because they're not technically considered PUIs. Um, so just to be aware that they're not they're not technically PUIs because they're being screened. Um, this is the current um, from UConnect uh, testing criteria for the UW. This is something that you know I anticipate is going to be changing. Obviously, it's been changing. Um, and th something that, again, that you guys are probably aware of, we're, screen we're testing people who have moderate symptoms or people who have mild symptoms with one of the, uh, at least one of the risk factors below. Um, but to stay in touch with that Uconnect hub, because again, this is gonna be something that's changing uh, over time. Diagnosis is via a single nasal pharyngeal swab, that's a RNA PCR. Um, something to know is that the sensitivity of this test, especially initially when we did not have in-house testing, was reported to be in the 75 to 85 percent range. So a fairly high, you know, concern or possibility of false negatives. Um, 
our current in-house testing is quoting a 98% sensitivity. Some people are skeptical of that. Um, it may be true. It may, you know, solely depend on the quality of the sample. Um, so obviously, uh, as always, important to collect a good sample, um, but still reasonable be to be skeptical uh, if you do have concern for a false negative. And, and so retesting in certain situations, well, overall is discouraged, but in certain situations is certainly appropriate if you do have high suspicion for a false negative. Nursing home patients or patients that are being discharged to nursing homes need to be retested. If you are not sure if it's appropriate to retest a patient, you call the 4400 special pathogens pager and um, they'll let you know uh, if it's appropriate to retest that person um, so that you don't collect a sample and, you know, go through that whole procedure and then um, end up getting it fine when it gets down to lab. Um, the current rapid test is coming at actually back within an hour, um, sometimes a little bit longer than that. Which is nice compared to like days before. Um, again, the the uh, major thing that we're concerned, one major thing that we're concerned about is transmission, and so PPE or appropriate PPE is very important and I'm sure you are all aware of the hundreds of emails that you've received about this. Um, I would say overall, um, you know, we could spend a whole lecture on this probably. So I'm gonna cover it just very briefly and say, go to the Uconnect Hub. There's um, a whole section on PPE. Um, I have here just the, um, the thing that you'll see commonly inpatient is this diagram showing what PPE you need to be wearing in what situations so far to the right here is the special pathogens um, PPE and uh, different between the uh, general care and ICU patients. Um, this is something that's scattered around the hospital at all of the um, all the PPE stations. So something that will be uh, very available to you. Um, but one other thing to consider is um, is taking a look at the the videos on UConnect for donning and doffing because there is a appropriate sequence to be putting on the PPE, taking off the PPE, et cetera, um, and trying to do that appropriate to limit any transmission. Obviously, making sure that you're fit tested as well. Um, then getting into the management issues um, for COVID patients, acute hypoxemic respiratory failure. I wanted to review this just a little bit because I think there are some differences um, to what we necessarily think when we're treating some respiratory patients in the hospital. But obviously this is what you're gonna be dealing with primarily in COVID positive patients. Um, some may have some hypercarbia, obviously in combination with that. Um, I think the main difference as far as when I think about a lot of respiratory patients in the hospital is, you know, you get a lot of COPD exacerbations, a lot of CHF exacerbations, um, you know, people with chronic lung disease and, and you may be less concerned about someone who has, you know, a oxygen saturation of 90, 91%. And, you know, we commonly set their goals at 88 to 92%. Um, that's something to be careful about and really the uh, saturation goals for these patients should be uh, probably greater than 94 um, percent. It's just the difference of dealing with acute hypoxemia. Um, there can be a, a pretty big difference in the uh, oxygen delivery to tissue between you know that 92 to 94 percent range um, especially if you're oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve is shifted to the right, as you can see here, you know, even at these higher saturations, if your curve is shifted to the right, you, you have uh, bigger differences in oxygen delivery. And, and just from case reports that I've heard about of patients who are kind of teetering on that 94 range, you know, you might get an ABG in there their pH is 7.24 and obviously, you know, maybe not a, not a lot of other signs that they're deteriorating. So something 
just to be aware of and probably having a little bit higher goals than you do maybe for some other respiratory patients and don't be afraid to get that ABG if you are wondering or if you're seeing even a slight uh, downtrend in their oxygenation. The, the treatment is obviously supportive as well as oxygen supplementation. The, the delivery mechanisms for oxygen supplementation are primarily nasal cannula and then progressing to a non rebreather. The reason for the non rebreather is because that's a closed system and with decreased risk for aerosolization. Um, we're trying to avoid high flow nasal cannula as well as BiPAP due to the increased risk for aerosolization and then transmission. Um, you can use BiPAP in, you know, COVID positive patients. The primary issue is a COPD exacerbation, um, but I wouldn't be using it in someone who, otherwise who does not have, you know, a COPD exacerbation. The, um, the other thing is that, you know, as someone trends towards a four to six liter oxygen requirement, you're, you're going to want to be in touch with the TLC by that point. Um, I mean, obviously there's a difference between someone who's been on four liters from day one of their hospitalization and, and stable on four liters at day six, but um, that patient who's going from two to three to four, you know, in several hours or even a day, you, you may want to be talking to the TLC about that patient just so that they're aware and they can make their assessment and, and consider early transfer to the ICU. Um, last but not least for uh, the respiratory failure component is proning. Um, certainly helpful for oxygenation in the acute setting. You know, the question of whether um, proning changes the trajectory of their illness or the ultimate outcome of, of where they may land is debatable and, it, it, you know, probably does not. But if you're having difficulty oxygenating someone, um, you certainly can try proning them um, if they don't have other contraindications. I know they're doing that at St. Mary's. They're doing it some at UW. Um, and, and so that's something to consider as well. Other important considerations outside of the respiratory um, failure issue, um, one being uh, fluid resuscitation. So these patients, you know, are going to come in in sepsis or or have AKIs, and you know, obviously they're going to probably need some fluid resuscitation. But uh, the recommendation is to be fairly cautious about that. Um, consider them more like your, you know, CHF exacerbation or your end stage renal patient who you might keep closer on, you know, a little more on the dry side, um, just due to this predilection for, you know, respiratory failure, ARDS, et cetera. Um, and so just be cautious about that. The next thing is, is, um, anticoagulation, um, these patients, especially those that do have high inflammatory markers, seem to be at higher risk for DVT-PE as well as um, microvascular thrombosis. Um, the, 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 our heme colleagues at UW have come up with a guideline recommendation for how to manage anticoagulation on inpatients. Um, I couldn't find it actually on Uconnect. Um, published yet, but I, but we did get word that this was a final recommendation. Um, I'm guessing that it, it will be published um, in the coming days. Um, I do have it summarized here if you need to refer back to it. Um, basically, you get an admission D-dimer fibrinogen uh, CB, and CBC without or with diff, and then you get a daily D-dimer fibrinogen and CBC without diff, and you want a every other day CRP. Um, obviously, just monitoring for DIC or some coagulopathies. Um, as far as pharmacologic uh, prophylax, DVT prophylaxis, you pretty much exclusively want to start these patients on pharmacologic prophylaxis, whatever type is appropriate for them, unless they have an absolute contraindication to doing so, um, such as active bleeding platelet count less than 25,000 or a fibrinogen less than 0.5. Um, 
the other issue that comes up is therapeutic dosing. So obviously, if you confirm a clot is present, you're going to start someone on therapeutic dosing. Um, but a, a common issue is um, these patients who, right, they come in in respiratory failure, they have an AKI in the ED, they don't want to do CTPE due to contrast load, and that is something that you should be cautious about. You know, whether you're a believer in how much contrast affects the kidneys and, and renal outcomes in hospitalized patients, you know, there's studies that kind of go both ways on that, but certainly people, at least anecdotally, are, are worried about the contrast um, exposure in these patients. So you may have trouble getting a CTPE or, you know, you want to be cautious about, about doing any contrast studies. Um, and so you may run into this issue of, right, should we be, you know, do I have high enough suspicion to therapeutically anticoagulate someone without, without a confirmatory study? And that's something that's, that's appropriate. Um, again, you, you, you probably won't be able to get like a VQ scan either because they likely are going to have, you know, abnormal chest x-rays and, and then the specificity of a VQ scan is very low. If you have questions, obviously, you know, team is there to help out, so. All right, getting into the specific treatments for, for COVID positive patients. This is um, UW's uh, uh, algorithm, again, off of Uconnect. Um, qualify this by saying it's a couple weeks old, and honestly, I, I feel like it's kind of moving in the direction of being a little bit out of date. Um, I'm not sure, I haven't heard about any uh, um, coming updates to this document, although I do know that they have a therapeutics work group. Um, just to summarize, outpatients who are COVID positive, it's symptomatic management. Inpatients who are on oxygen, um, you can consider hydroxychloroquine or asorbic acid, i.e. vitamin C. Um, and then on mechanical ventilation, you add um, obviously the concern for ARDS and um, cytokine storm, and you can consider tocolizumab, which we'll get into. But um, jumping into those specific treatments, um, hydroxychloroquine, I think, initially was the most common thing that people were using, but it really is falling out of, out of favor. Um, anecdotally, anecdotally, at least, the, there's hasn't been a lot of benefit noted, um, and, and the studies are mixed. Um, the proposed mechanism for hydroxychloroquine is um, alkalization of the intracellular environment, uh, which leads to inhibition of viral entry and viral repl replication. Um, like I said, the studies are mixed on this. There was a study out of China with 100 patients that showed that chloroquine was superior to the control as far as inhibiting exacerbation of pneumonia. Um, but there are other studies that really show no difference. Um, and there, there are some studies that show, you know, differences in what we'd probably consider clinically um, irrelevant outcomes like days of viral shedding. Um, so this is, like I said, something that I think we're, it, people are starting to move away from. That doesn't mean it's something that's not being used. Um, and we'll get a, more into that. If someone is on a hydroxychloroquine, they should have a baseline EKG done, um, and they should be on continued continuous telemetry. Um, contraindications to its use are left bundle branch block, uh, ejection fraction less than 35%, and a QT of greater than 500. Um, we are not recommending the use of azithromycin with hydroxychloroquine due to uh, uh, QT prolongation elongation concerns. A little bit more of an optimistic slide, um, I would say, are the next two topics. Vitamin C, um, the proposed mechanism of vitamin C is that it protects the pulmonary endothelial barrier, reduces free radicals, and then has beneficial, multiple beneficial effects on the immune system. Um, this recommendation um, is essentially based off of a, a good, a really good study, a multi-centered double-blind double randomized control trial um, called the Citrus Ali trial. It found lower mortality in, in patients treated with vitamin C 
um, 29% versus 46%, so quite a big difference. Um, the, I guess patient population, you could debate as to whether is perfectly applicable. These were early sepsis patients and ARDS patients. So, right, something, you know, patient populations that we're trying to avoid um, uh, having, but uh, the question is, is treatment, you know, prior to ARDS or sepsis, you know, helpful for these patients? I guess it would be debatable. Um, the other issue with the study is um, that mortality was a secondary outcome. I think that issue has kind of been um, put to rest, um, but, you know, technically as a secondary outcome shouldn't necessarily be taken um, as the best evidence. But, uh, and then the other issue being that initially when they published this study, there was no difference in their um, their primary outcomes, which were sofa, a change in SOFA score or CRP levels. Um, ultimately, more recently, the study has kind of been reanalyzed because if you think about it, um, the, the study was probably subject to survival ship bias, which is this idea that, you know, if, if many more patients died in the control group and you're not calculating SOFA scores for that, those people who die, you're only left with the SOFA scores for those who survived, um, then yeah, you're not gonna show a difference in the, in the SOFA score. So they did just publish a postdoc analysis showing improvement of SOFA scores when you consider that. Um, so I think this is actually a good study. I mean, the time, the exact patient population to use it in, um, you know, maybe have question, but seems to be of some benefit. Current guideline at UW recommends starting that on, uh, or at least considering starting it on patients who have an O2 requirement, and then there's a higher dose recommended um, if you're on greater than four liters. Another optimistic slide I would say is convalescent plasma. This is like the big topic right now in treatment. Um, uh, plasma, convalescent plasma is plasma collected from recently recovered COVID patients. So they have the antibodies to the novel coronavirus. Um, there is a current clinical trial going on at UW, um, although it's not technically considered a clinical trial because there's no control group. So it's like an investigational use of a medication or something like that. But anyway, it is a study. Um, and the uh, first patient was treated on uh, 412, so just over a week ago. Um, and there have been a handful treated. Uh, I, I guess our last update was the middle of last week, so I'm not sure um, more recently. It seems to be most useful just prior to patients developing ARDS. So as you can see here, the inclusion criteria for treatment, um, you know, the people are, are on the sicker side, so respiratory rate greater than 30, P to F ratio less than 300, and then SpO2 of less than 93. Um, so whether you would be treating patients on the floor with this, I, I'm not, you know, exactly sure, but certainly something to be aware of that that that, that is being looking looked into and, and has reasonable evidence for it, and the benefit being obviously the passive immunity, which we'll talk about a little bit more in just a second, um, the risks being transfusion reaction, um, fevers, itching rash, and then there's a theoretical concern of whether we could be uh, blunting the patient's own immune system by providing preformed antibodies. Um, passive immunity, just to review, I'm not gonna talk about all the mechanisms in which passive immunity um, help your immune system work. You can read them off there. Um, but convalescent plasma has been used um, since 1907 for prevention and then later uh, the treatment of measles and currently has uh, evidence-based indications um, in, this, in the setting of a vast number of infectious diseases, primarily um, in the setting of post-exposure prophylaxis um, for several viruses as well as bacteria, um, but also for the treatment of tetanus, diphtheria, and botulism. And, you know, some of the efficacy of, of those, that treatment, especially in the post-exposure post prophylaxis, 
groups, you know, could be in the 80 to 90 percent effective range, um, you're you're going to see lower efficacy in, in treatment um, groups. Um, but certainly something probably better than we're seeing with with a lot of these other treatments. There are um, a couple studies that have been published on uh, convalescent plasma specifically for COVID patients. Um, they're very small. The biggest one I was able to find was um, 10 patients. I know there was another one in the US with five patients. Um, this one was out of China. Um, they treated 10 patients and then selected uh, 10 random historical controls, meaning basically 10 people who met the inclusion criteria for their study, um, but did not receive treatment. Um, so in comparison, they did have faster improvement in symptoms and more patients were weaned from oxygen, um, including uh, two or three, I can't remember off the top of my head, being weaned from mechanical ventilation where none were weaned from mechanical ventilation in the pseudo control group. <clears throat> Other treatments um, that you're going to see less of, um, but still want you to know about, um, the two antivirals are remdesivir and then uh, the combination of lopinavir, ritonavir. Um, remdesivir, I would say, is uh, a little bit more promising than the lopinavir, ritonavir combination. Um, and, but is something that, uh, as far as I've seen, is only being used in the ICU setting. Um, lopinavir, ritonavir, there was a randomized control trial of 199 patients showing no benefit in time to clinical improvement. And um, there is a current phase three trial with this medication in coronavirus. And we have an inside man, Alex Millsap has a, a buddy who's um, uh, works in that industry and said that they're recruiting more uh, patients for their phase three trial, which is generally not a good sign, um, meaning that they're looking for um, smaller differences in effect size or feeling their, their study wasn't powered appropriately, et cetera. Um, so I would be a little bit less optimistic all, uh, on that one, although that is part of the UW, as I mentioned earlier, treatment algorithm that's starting to get a little bit out of date. Um, tocilizumab is a monoclonal antibody to IL-6 receptor. Um, this is something that is being used again in the ICU setting for patients who um, start to develop that elevated IL-6 and uh, concern for cytokine storm. There was a lot of hot to uh, topics about um, ACEs and ARBs as well as NSAIDs in the beginning of this whole pandemic. Um, there's really no evidence or no recommendation um, for the, from the UW or any other organization that I was able to find to start or stop these medications. So something that is, is more theoretical than practical. Uh, lastly, steroids. Um, Steroids should not be necessarily used for uh, um, COVID pneumonia in and of itself. Um, it should really be reserved for other indications in which it is already being used, such as refractory shock, ARDS, or you know COPD exacerbations, as we talked about before. Um, obviously, you're going to be using steroids. Um, so we'll talk um, briefly, and you can review yourself a little bit more if you would like, both the IDSA recommendations as well as the American Thoracic Society recommendations for treatment. Um, I would say they mirror each other pretty well. Um, and the IDSA recommendations are probably a little bit harder to interpret in that they're kind of use very subtle wording in, as to what they recommend and what they don't. For example, if you look at these first two points, hydroxychloroquine should be used in the setting of a clinical trial, whereas hydroxychloroquine plus azithromycin should only be used in the context of a clinical trial. And in my interpretation, that's you know a lesser uh, recommendation than than the first. So really, if you look at it, they have kind of stronger recommendations for hydroxychloroquine as well as um, convalescent plasma being used in the setting of a clinical trial, but 
all of this highlights the need for higher quality studies. Um, and basically that's what they're saying is, you know, if, you sh if you're using these treatments, you know, really optimally, we should be collecting data on these patients. Um, let's see what else, basically the same things that we've already said. Um, they recommend against steroids and COVID pneumonia, but um, recommend for steroids and, and ARDS. Uh, again, the ATS recommendations, I, I think, are actually kind of interesting. They put together a group of 80 people, um, 80 ATS members, and um, they reported out as um, what percentage of those 80 members were for a certain recommendation um, versus didn't really have a recommendation versus were against the recommendation. So you can kind of see with those numbers um, kind of the spectrum of of recommendations, both, you know, how confident maybe should I be in this, this recommendation or uh, as well as kind of just the variation in, in what we're seeing um, in treatment strategies. Overall, again, their recommendation, their number one recommendation was collect data. Even if you are not doing it in the context of a clinical trial, try to collect data um, so that, that it could even be used in some sort of retrospective study and they give recommendations on um, what types of outcomes um, we should be focusing on. Uh, they do recommend hydroxychloroquine for inpatients with pneumonia. As you see, 70, 73% were for that, um, but not for outpatients or inpatients without pneumonia. Um, again, they're, they're not for or against any of these things, remdesivir, lopinavir, ritonavir, tocolizumab, or corticosteroids. Um, but as you can see, like the, the remdesivir, 68% um, were for it uh, and 5% were against, but they still gave a final recommendation of not for or against. So, you know, maybe that's a little bit more promising um, than, than the lopinavir, ritonavir, um, although again, more evidence is needed. And then 99% of them were for prone ventilation in refractory hypoxemia, so a strong recommendation for that. Um, again, these are primarily mechanically ventilated patients, um, but kind of uh, mirrors the recommendation that you know we can do that on the floor as well. So overall, um, let's see a summary of the treatment here. Um, as I've mentioned several times, there's a lack of evidence. Um, ideally, we would be enrolling in clinical trials and collecting data on these patients. Um, vitamin C and convalescent plasma seem to have the most indirect, at least, evidence of benefit, um, as well as fairly low harms in both of those treatments. I mean, obviously, we have to consider the harms of, of some of the other things like hydroxychloroquine. Um, and, and overall, um, to conclude, right, there's really no absolute right answer as to how to go about treating these patients. A lot of, you know, people are doing it differently. Um, and so the best thing, I think, is to be talking to your colleagues, seeing what people are doing, um, and, and, and collecting data. Um, and so um, I, I think that's the overall summary of, of the treatment strategy specifically for COVID. Um, a few things that I wanted to touch on, but probably didn't have time to do justice, um, are the importance of early goals of care discussions in these patients, uh, especially given their predilection to decompensate fairly quickly. You don't want to miss out on that opportunity um, if you do have one early on. Um, also, obviously, um, involvement of palliative care, both of these things I, I think were, were kind of ahead of the curve in family medicine, but something to not forget about, um, especially with these patients. Um, two more things, as far as CPR and code recommendations, um, there is a document that I have linked to at the bottom here uh, on UConnect about UW Health's recommendations for code situations. Um, again, this is a high risk, you know, procedure as far as transmission and exposure for healthcare workers. So limiting the number of, of workers that are 
in the room to approximately four members. This is not a strict rule, but something to strive for. You know, other members of the team, such as pharmacy, um, you know, record keepers and things like that should be outside of the room. Um, lastly, you know, there's this uh, obviously very unique from an ethics standpoint. Um, there's a special ethics consult team that has been put together, especially for a situation if we we're in a surge situation and we we're, you know, having issues with resource utilization. Obviously, you know, that's one of the big reasons that they're there. But, the, you know, I, I think in, in speaking with some of the hospitalists and especially critical care doctors, um, you know, they're, they're giving stronger recommendations for these patients than um, other patients to be DNR uh, because um, both of the increased risk of harm in transmission uh, when doing CPR, as well as the perceived at least um, decreased risk of, or decreased benefit in these patients where the mechanism of death is cytokine storm, ARDS, and multi-organ failure, uh, obviously something that's not gonna respond very well um, to CPR. So everyone has to work on their own comfort level as far as how confidently they can re recommend or how strongly they can recommend a DNR status um, to a COVID positive patient, but something you certainly wouldn't be alone in doing. Um, and I think it's just also an interesting discussion. Um, but also know that the, the ethics committee is there for questions on that as well. Lastly, um, discharge planning for these patients, uh, really similar to any other respiratory patient. Um, you know, obviously you want them to be improving from a respiratory standpoint, decreasing oxygen requirements. You can discharge them on oxygen if you want. Um, that is being done some uh, other considerations, although there's no strict um, discharge criteria that's been promoted by the UW itself. Other things I came across just in researching this um, is to consider patients being afebrile for uh, greater than 72 hours and greater than seven days from their last positive test is due to the possibility that patients tend to worsen, you know, kind of later on after a week of, of symptoms, et cetera. So something to consider, although again, not a strict uh, recommendation. Then for discharge to congregate living facilities, SNFs and ALFs, um, for COVID positive patients, they do require two consecutive negative tests at at least 24 hours apart. Um, so making sure that you start that testing um, in order to facilitate discharge to a sniffer ALF. Lastly, something interesting going on, there's a work group at UW doing this hospital at home work for patients who could potentially be discharged from um, directly from the ED on oxygen if they were felt to be appropriate and then seeing um, seen at home. Again, this is something that would only come into play if we were in a surge situation, but uh, something interesting from a planning standpoint. Um, I wanted to thank uh, both Nicole Bonk and Alex Millsap for uh, their insights uh, and experiences with COVID patients and, and help with this presentation, um, as well as really the UW Hospitalist Group has uh, is where a lot of this has come from in, in those um, meetings that I've been a part of and shared resources and um, and that's been really helpful. Um, so with that, I, I guess uh, we have time for uh, for some discussion, questions, and and feel free to chime in. Hi there. Yeah. Um, Sarah Schaff here. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Um, so I've had the privilege of working uh, with the hospitalist group at St. Clair. And so they're following the recommendations of like SSM and the ID group at St. Mary's. Yep. And something that I noticed that was a little bit different between what you presented and what we're doing 
and of course things change every day, is that St. Mary's did have an investigational um, use of tocilizumab in a very small group of patients. I think it was like 10 patients. Um, they felt it was beneficial in preventing the cytokine storm and the need for intubation. Mm -hmm. So they recommended, um, I think three days ago, that as a group of hospitals, we stop using hydroxychloroquine mm -hmm. because they did not feel it was helpful. And then they recommend that uh, we do use tocilizumab and they have several inclusion criteria but basically their inflammatory markers need to be up. They need to be febrile, but they need to have not yet needed ventilatory support. So these are patients that may be on like three or four liters of oxygen before they kind of crash. And the idea with us is to use tocilizumab to prevent that crash. Um, ideally, it would be great to have an IL-6 lab back before you use tocilizumab, but in practice that it, there, it takes like two weeks for us to get an IL-6 result. So we are giving them tocilizumab without the actual IL-6 lab. Um, something else that I noticed that was different between what we're doing and what you're doing is that we are using high flow nasal cannula after, um, after, we, after the patient needs more support than just a normal nasal cannula would give them. Um, I guess there was a study done on, I think, in the New England Journal of Medicine, where they um, kind of dyed the uh, the respiratory secretions that would come out of a person with a high flow nasal cannula and a um, droplet mask over that nasal cannula, and they found that the amount of aerosolization of uh, droplets was actually uh, pretty well controlled with that um, droplet mask over the high flow nasal cannula. So we're using that quite preferentially to BiPAP or CPAP, because as you could imagine for BiPAP or CPAP, you can't really use a mask um, over that to control droplet aerosolization as well. Um, and of course that patient has to be in a negative pressure room at that time. But those were the two things that I noticed that might be a little bit different from between what I'm doing and what you discussed. Yeah, um, um, yeah, I certainly think that the, as you mentioned, the hydroxychloroquine um, is falling out of favor, and and that the tocilizumab is something that, um, at least in our current algorithm, is listed as an ICU medication, but I think is is again gaining some momentum. Our hospital, we are proning. <laughs> Um, I don't think you guys have a stronger recommendation to prone than, than we necessarily have seen, but. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I, our ICU nurses have been trained to prone ICU patients. We haven't actually proned an ICU patient yet, but patients on the floor are being, you know, advised to lay on their stomachs. Um, Dr. Mohan, uh, very, <laughs> very strongly and humorously uh, yeah, encourages patients to lay on their stomachs at St. Mary's. Mm -hmm. I can see that. And this is Mavish. Just a quick question. With regards to proning, is it following like an ARDS protocol or is it kind of just ad lib since they're awake most of them and like not sedated? Can you just talk to me a little like, bit more about that so, proning? So pr are you talking about proning in non-mechanically ventilated patients or? Yep. So I guess I'm not sure what your question is then because I mean, as far as the ARDS protocol, I, I think of like, mechanical ventilation settings and yeah so is it done being done like on the floor in patients that are not mechanically ventilated yeah i i, is it I just think it's an so as far as like the what, the professional society recommendations i think they're talking about mechanically ventilated patients um but you know ssm came out with their recommendation and it looks like to uh, prone patients who um, even on the floor are having difficulty oxygenate, oxygenating. I think, right, the, the question is, does this change anything or are you only buying time? And sometimes you need to buy time. Um, so, you know, it seems reasonable to me to, um, to prone someone who uh, looks like they're struggling or has increasing oxygen requirements and you're trying to buy yourself some time to, get them to the appropriate setting. Um, I don't know that 
having someone lay on their stomach for their entire hospitalization is either realistic or you know that it's going to necessarily change their ultimate outcome that's my interpretation i may be, may be able to speak to what i've been advised to do a little bit more specifically um for our non mechanically ventilated patients that are able to reposition themselves independently because they are not paralyzed or anything they're recommended to not be on their backs for 18 hours a day so they every couple hours the nurse is supposed to encourage them to turn onto their stomachs but if they can't do that onto one side or the other and to change positions every few hours um, and then for mechanically ventilated patients, we're following in ARDS protocol for proning. Mm -hmm. Like, it, it, we've, there's some signal in the literature about not only microthrombi, but also an increased propensity toward hemorrhage in COVID patients. Have you seen anything about that or learned anything about that? Um, I have not. I was basing uh, basing that portion on the recommendations of our, our hematology uh, consult team at UW. There are, I mean, I've seen studies that, I mean, I've certainly seen the studies that they're in, at increased risk, risk for um, clotting. You know, in general, you could assume, right, coagulopathies don't just in, um, involve um, clotting, but also do involve bleeding. Um, so that wouldn't be surprising. Obviously, they also, you know, develop DIC and, and little platelets and things like that. So I don't think that necessarily um, contradicts, though, the, the recommendation for anticoagulation. Um, my understanding is that there's pretty good evidence that we should not be oxygenating people to a goal above 96% due to some increased mortality. So. When you were saying above 94, does that really mean between 94 and 96? Yeah, probably. The, what, from what I've been seeing, the, the recommendation is that you really shouldn't be having these people in the low 90s. I mean, obviously, right, that's with the caveat that, right, if someone's in with a COVID COPD exacerbation, you're not concerned about pneumonia, um, you know that's going to be a different scenario than than COVID. Um, but it's my understanding that we should be trying to keep these people um, in the mid 90s. Is turnaround to state lab same as UW? My nursing home patient sample is going to WSL this morning. Um, I am not sure if it's the same. I don't. Th I guess that what I is that there's rapid testing at UW that's under an hour and that other turnaround times ha have been in like the four to six hour time period. But I do believe that even at the state lab, they're getting them back um, within the day, although I I'm not 100% certain on that. Well, thanks everyone for joining. Um, good to kind of see in this uh, pandemic world, at least some names that I'm familiar with and, um, and, and I hope you guys are all doing well.